Right. Um, greetings, everyone, from the Australian National University here in Canberra. Um, a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us today. I hope you're all keeping safe and healthy uh, during what are some very strange times. My name is Jay and I look after international relations and partnerships here at the ANU. I'm joined today by my colleague Arthur Shu and of course our speaker for today, Professor Uli Matthesius. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional owners of the land and airways that we are broadcasting to you today from. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'll now very briefly introduce our speaker uh, for today, Professor Uli Matthesius. Um, so Uli is currently a professor in the ANU Research School of Biology, uh, where she also is the head of the Division of Plant Sciences. Her research interests focus on nitrogen fixing symbiosis, parasitic root knot nematodes, and microbial and environmental control of root developmental plasticity. Plasticity. Did I get that right? Probably wrong. Um, she has won many fellowships and grants from the Australian Research Councils. I won't list all of them here, um, and also fellowships from other national foundations as well. Uh, Uli has also been a recipient of many prizes and awards, including the Australian Academy of Science Fenner Medal, which recognised her distinguished biological research at the molecular, cellular and whole plant level. Uli is also a passionate educator and has received multiple teaching awards from the ANU, from the ACT and the Australian Commonwealth Government. Um, so without further ado, I'll now hand over to Professor Uli Matisses to tell us how we will produce food crops for 10 billion with less resources. Over to you, Uli. Thank you very much, Jay, for the introduction and uh, also for organizing this whole session. It's great to see so many people participating. I will share my screen. Just a sec. I hope everyone can see this. All right. Good, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Uli Matesius, as uh, Jay said, and much of what we do at the Research School of Biology and Plant Sciences is um, focused on food security uh, in Australia and internationally. And my talk today will be about ideas of how to grow more from less. Um, how, will we, how will we be producing food crops for potentially 10 billion people um, over the next few decades with less resources. To start off with, um, as Jay did, I would like to um, acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gumbri people who are the traditional owners of the land upon which the university's Acton campus is located, which you can see here. Um, we, we pay our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people, Indigenous peoples, past, present and future, and acknowledge that this land from which we benefit has an ancient history that is both rich and sacred. So with that, oops. I would like to just give you a brief overview of what I'll be talking to you about. So first I will just, um, introduce you to the challenges that agriculture will face over the next at least 30 years and beyond. And then mention some of the solutions that we might have to address those challenges. I will do that by just mentioning a few of the examples of the kind of research that is going on in plant science at the Research School of Biology that address food security. And then I'll give you a slightly longer case study um, on solutions for the nitrogen problem, which is one of the, the biggest problems agriculture faces. And at the end, I'll tell you just a little bit about studying plant sciences at the ANU. So as you probably all know, um, one of the, the big challenges um, that we all face uh, is the population increase at this happened rather rapidly, um, mainly over the last few hundred years, and which is um, growing very steadily. To make it look uh, slightly less daunting, um, here's a, a blown up picture of the, the world population from about 1950 um, and projected to about 2050. So in 1960, we had 3 billion people at the moment, so I just looked up the, 
the world population life clock. Uh, as of uh, half an hour ago, we had 7,871,174,792, and that's been going up by about three people a second since then. And about 250,000 people have been born today. So our population is increasing, and it's likely um, to hit about 9 billion people uh, towards 2050, maybe more. That will all um, need food. Um, parallel to that, of course, as you also all know, um, one of the problems that this has caused and that many other things have caused is a huge rise in greenhouse gases like CO2. Um, the current value of uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere as of a few days ago was 419 parts per million and that is about three parts per million higher than the same time last year. So these values keep going up. And one of the problems that it's causing, of course, is um, a rise in global temperature. But as you can see from this image, the rise in global temperature is not even. Some countries are much more affected than others. Um, Australia is quite badly affected by uh, not just an increase in temperature, but also more extreme weather events that um, have caused huge problems for crop production. This year, um, luckily, has been wet and coolish so far, and we're waiting for some snow to arrive in the next couple of days. But uh, nevertheless, the trend is, is upwards. And you might think that um, plants might actually like the, the warmer weather and, and might grow better. But um, one problem with high temperatures is that um, if it hits plants at the time when they flower and when, when they set pollen, um, this, this severely damages the pollen and, and then the subsequent production of seeds, which is what we usually eat, for example, in cereal. So, so the global models predict that even a one percent, a one degree rise in temperature will decrease yields by up to 10% in several crops in all but the, the highest latitudes on the planet. So that will severely um, reduce, reduce how much food we can produce. The other huge limitation is water. So water um, is, is used for irrigating a large proportion of our crops. Uh, in Australia, many crops are ir irrigated. And you can see um, irrigation of crops is, is huge in many countries and rising. And this has led to a prediction that um, water will be very scarce in many countries by 2025 and that will only get worse over time. So this map shows you places which are not water scarce here in blue, um, countries in yellow that have economic water scarcity. So water is scarce, um, it will be become more expensive but it's still there. But then there's a large number of countries where physically there is just not enough water to go around and irrigate crops if we keep going as we are. And so, you know, this severely limits crop growth around the world. The reason why water is so important is it's, it's a rate limiting factor for plant growth. So this, this graph here plots the productivity of crops averaged over many different plant species against precipitation and you can see there's a sharp rise up to a saturation level and um, you know after after um, a certain level is, is is reached plants are not not water limited anymore and the main reason why plants require so much water is that when they take up co2 from the air through little pores in the on the surface of the leaves called stomata which they need for photosynthesis and, and carbon gain. And as soon as they open these little holes on the surface of the leaf, water vapor um, will disappear out of these leaves. And so the only way to stop uh, water from leaving is to close these stomata, but then plants cannot photosynthesize. So there is a trade-off between growth and yield and loss of water, which is 
underlying much of the strategies that people are using to try and make plants more tolerant to drought. The temperature and water stress um, is also a factor that drives plant diseases. So just as with us, if we are more stressed, we, we are more likely to get sick. And with plants, it's the same. If they're stressed because they have to fight um, extreme temperatures or extreme drought, and they cannot photosynthesize properly and produce enough nutrients, they get diseases, um, like you can see here in, in, in rice fields. And diseases are a huge problems in agriculture, causing large crop losses, um, 20, 30% easily. Um, and of course, um, farmers will uh, try to counter that by spraying plants with pesticides. And you can see here across the world, pesticide use uh, on croplands. And you can see this has gone up really, really steadily around the world, which is of course not great because a lot of these pesticides are quite toxic. They're killing a lot of other animals and reducing biodiversity. They also can be very, very toxic to farmers. So we have to also find solutions to making plants more resistant to pathogens and parasites so that we can reduce the, the footprint from pesticides. You can see here a graph of um, biodiversity loss. So the number of species living on our planet is, is decreasing dramatically. Um, and a large factor in that is um, expansion of agriculture uh, into places that used to have you know, national parks and forests and, and savannas and so on use of pesticides and fertilizers that reduce the number of species that live on our planet and that keep ecosystems stable. And this is another huge problem that we are facing around the world. People have modeled um, which factors are most out of balance on our planet and biosphere integrity is one the other one is um, a huge imbalance in biogeochemical flows of um, things like phosphorus and nitrogen. So these ones, um, this is sort of a safe operating boundary here. And we are operating way outside safe boundaries um, in our use of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers for agriculture. And this is something that I will address in the second half of my talk uh, on how we could reduce these huge footprints that agriculture has. So the challenges for agriculture are that it's predicted that the world needs to produce at least 50% more food to feed an estimated 5 billion people by 2050. But if climate change happens at the same time as predicted, and it's happening right now, that could co cro uh, cut crop yields by more than 25% because of extreme heat, extreme droughts, diseases, and so on. And expansion of agriculture means that, that land and biodiversity, ocean, forests, and other, other forms of natural capital are, are being depleted at unprecedented rates. So we just cannot keep expanding agriculture as we have been over the past decades. And unless we change how we grow our food and manage our natural capital, food security, especially for the world's poorest nation, will be um, at risk quite severely. Okay, to just put that into, into pictures, um, creating sustainable food future by 2050 is a challenge. So we have to produce roughly 50% more food uh, than we are at the moment because of just the increase in the number of people. Also, people's food choices have changed. So people eat more meat and dairy and growing meat and dairy takes uh, a lot of um, input uh, if we feed them um, in feedlots with crop, crops that have been grown with a high input of fertilizer, for example, rather than grazing. Um, so at the moment, we're using 50% of the vegetated land on our planet just for agriculture. Okay? So we really need to free up some land 
and it would be good to save uh, an area of um, forests um, of at least two times the size of India to really reduce the footprint of agriculture and restore uh, natural ecosystems. So we have to do this all um, at the same time as lowering emissions from agriculture severely. Um, all sectors of the industry have to lower emissions. It could happen by improved feeds for animals, by plant-based food, and some, a lot of solutions for growing crops more efficiently, um, as I will talk to you about in the next few minutes. Agriculture is also um, using about 70% of total water use for humans. So it's a huge amount of water that gets put towards agriculture that really um, we would need for a lot of other uses. So the footprint of agriculture is large. At the moment, it's still growing, but we know that it cannot keep growing without um, huge um, detrimental effects to our planet. And the, the footprint that agriculture has is, for example, for methane um, release from, from rice paddies, from so soil fertilization and that I will talk about uh, in a few minutes, just energy use for transporting things, making fertilizer and so on. Manure management and um, wastes from ruminant animals. So um, ruminant am animals produce a lot of methane that is a potent uh, greenhouse gas. So Altogether, at the moment, agriculture contributes to about 10 to 12 percent of all greenhouse gas emission, not to talk of all the other um, detrimental effects. So agriculture has to become more efficient over the, part, over the next few decades. And so agriculture is, is physically leaving scars and it's leaving scars uh, in our, causing big problems uh, all across our, our planet. So what are the solutions? So basically we have to grow more with less. We have to in reduce the input into agriculture severely. We have to grow food with less water, with less pesticides, with less fertilizer. Okay, so some of the uh, approaches that are being taken around the world and that are also taken by um, members of uh, the um, Division of Plant Sciences here at the ANU includes uh, these four areas that I will just uh, briefly address. Um, one big one is drought tolerance, so making plants more resistant to drought so that with less water they will grow just the same as, as with uh, irrigation. This is mainly done through breeding but also through management of, of fields and so on. Enhancing photosynthesis is a big area that many people in our um, school are working on because increasing uh, the amount of carbon capture by plants and translating that into higher yields um, would save uh, the water at the same time because um, the efficiency of photosynthesis, they're more efficient at capturing carbon, as I explained before, then plants uh, will not have to open their stomata as much and they will not lose as much water. Another area that's really important in our um, school is uh, disease resistance. So natural resistance of plants against uh, mainly uh, fungal pathogens, nematodes uh, or mycetes, which cause huge crop losses around the world. And so if we have uh, inbuilt disease resistance through resistance proteins in plants that would circumvent the use uh, of um, toxic pesticides. And another area that I will talk about later is nutrient use efficiency. So using, growing the same amount of crops with less input from fertilizer. So here are a few examples. Um, there has been a long history in our uh, division on uh, understanding drought tolerance and, and water use efficiency. Um, one of the, the champions in this area is uh, Graham Farquhar. Um, who has uh, won every prize uh, on the planet that he could have won. He has spent his life, um, he's a mathematician and physicist who has uh, found an interest in plant science uh, a long time ago and he's, he's produced the, 
the world's most important uh, and, and most used uh, equations for modeling water loss and gas exchange in leaves based on physical models. Uh, and that has led to um, methods based on mass spectrometry to select and breed plants that can uh, grow better with uh, less water use. Has, has made a huge impact on um, uh, growing wheat in Australia with less water. Uh, another area um, with different types of applications is um, to try and improve drought tolerance by trying to understand the biochemical mechanisms that go on inside a leaf to control the opening of stomata and the loss of water and uh, uptake of CO2 through um, chemical signals in the leaf and then to try and mimic those signals to make chemical applications based on natural products that can be used, for example, uh, you know, by drones. A lot of uh, this uh, agriculture is getting more more automated. Um, you can imagine uh, treating plants in the field with signaling molecules that tell them to close the stomata under certain conditions to conserve water on the spot, rather than uh, engineering the plants to do that themselves. All of this research is being uh, also translated to the field and to ecosystem studies um, and we have to scale the understanding that we get from, uh, from leaf uh, water exchange and in leaves to actual landscape models um, and scale from genome to, to biome and, and people in the school are doing this for example Patrick Meyer is working on rainforests uh, in both Australia and, and South America and trying to understand how whole forests respond to climate change, how species diversity affects uh, the function of these forest ecosystems, and, and how climate stable soil carbon stocks are, which are also really uh, important in the equation of carbon emissions. Um, and this has led to, to predictions and models of how species survive climate change or land use change, for example, deforestation or whether that would have to necessitate migration over uh, a short time period. So, so we don't only work on agricultural systems, but also on, uh, on natural ecosystems. Uh, other groups uh, in the school are trying to improve photosynthesis by very targeted uh, interventions and uh, engineering of the enzymes that fix CO2. So Robisco is uh, an enzyme complex that fixes CO2. The enzyme is very, very well understood. Uh, it's a very inefficient uh, enzyme and people are trying to make it more efficient so that plants can be more efficient at capturing CO2 and conserving water. And one approach is directed evolution of these uh, enzymes and then testing out um, mutated forms of these enzymes, uh, for example, initially in bacteria to see um, what part of this enzyme makes it more efficient and to then engineer that into crop plants. Other people are working on genetic regulation of, of crop yields, uh, plant development, and also disease resistance. So you might have heard of microRNAs, which are small RNAs that uh, regulate many genes and that are now a major target of many approaches in uh, engineering crops to, um, be, to change any of their characteristics really through manipulation of, of small microRNAs in the plant. Um, as I mentioned before, a, a large part of what uh, people are trying to do for um, increasing pro crop productivity is to reduce the threat from diseases. So, Diseases um, cost Australia, uh, even just wheat uh, in wheat, uh, which is one of our major crops in Australia, cost Australia about $1 billion uh, of losses per annum. So several groups are working on trying to understand the pathogens that infect wheat. So genome sequencing and, and RNA sequencing technologies um, and with the end, end goal of identifying specific proteins and, and their exact composition that confer resistance to pathogens that are very destructive uh, in the field. And there's also <clears throat> approaches in plant structural immunity, so understanding 
protein structure and function of those proteins that um, confer disease resistance uh, with the aim of uh, producing designer proteins that can um, prevent pathogens from infecting the plant and disarming those pathogens so that you don't have to spray them with pesticides. Um, and now I want to give you a slightly longer case study of uh, something that's close to what I'm doing, um, and that is to engineer nitrogen fixing symbiosis. So we've got a problem with nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up uh, only 0.1% of the Earth's crust, but about 78% of our atmosphere. But it's very non-reactive. So we just breathe it in and out, and so do plants. So um, high organisms cannot cannot uh, break the triple bond in the nitrogen molecule. So for any living organisms to take up nitrogen, and that is one of our major constituents of all of our proteins and DNA, without which we could not live, um, this nitrogen must be solubilized, for example, as ammonium, before it can be used by, by any cells. And this happens in, in mainly two ways, either industrially, so fertilizer synthesis in the Haber-Bosch process, or symbiotically in bacteria. So the environmental costs of nitrogen fertilizers that have been poured onto our fields, either in term, forms of manure or synthetic uh, fertilizer, has caused a huge problem um, worldwide. It's just, uh, we're just using too much nitrogen and it causes algal blooms, it causes destruction of whole ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef. The emissions that are caused from nitrogen that gets volatilized um, are a huge problem as greenhouse gases and as um, uh, pollutants that uh, cause people to breathing problems. And the synthesis of nitrogen fertilizer alone uses one to two percent of of the of our whole fossil fuel um, reserves on the planet. So, so people have uh, estimated the economic costs from cleaning up nitrogen pollution just in the EU as between 100 and 400 billion dollars annually. That is a large amount of money. And this is cleaning up waterways people's health, greenhouse gas emission, and so on. And, and most of this nitrogen comes from agriculture, all these green sectors here. Okay. And the cost of cleaning up this nitrogen pollution is actually more than double the value that nitrogen fertilizers are estimated to add to farm income. It's just that it's carried by governments rather than the farmer. So there's a huge need to reduce nitrogen fertilizers. And you can see that that is particularly important in Europe, China and India, North America and um, other areas. Uh, so far, not so much. But uh, we do have another solution for this problem. And that solution is provided by bacteria. So um, only bacteria have an enzyme called nitrogenase that they use to convert nitrogen from the air into ammonia. And these bacteria can form a symbiosis with plants. So this is a, a section through a root. And this root has been colonized by bacteria. So all these green dots here are bacteria that fix nitrogen that sit inside the roots of these plants. You can see these nodules that the bacteria make on the root system. Very specific bacteria do this to very specific plants, not all plants. And they convert uh, nitrogen into ammonia, which they feed to the plant in exchange for carbon that the plant has from photosynthesis. It's a very special symbiosis. Oops, this picture looks funny. Um, this is uh, the enzyme complex that um, provides this reaction. Nitrogenase, which uh, takes electrons and protons, combines it with nitrogen gas to produce ammonia. A hugely important reaction in our biosphere uh, and the only input of nitrogen biologically into all ecosystems. In terms of uh, value for the um, agriculture, benefit from nitrogen fixing bacteria is huge. So here you can see some soybean plants. Here are some normal ones. They, live, they grow in an unfertilized field. 
this is a mutant that cannot form this symbiotic association with bacteria. And you can see they're much smaller, they're yellow, because they don't have enough nitrogen. So the only difference is that these plants associate with bacteria that fix nitrogen, and these ones don't. Otherwise, they are identical. So um, all over the world, um, this symbiosis fixes about 40 million tons of nitrogen per year. And it saves about 50 million tons of fertilizer, it's about 3.4 uh, in Australia. And it has an economic value of about $63 billion. So this is just the work of lots and lots of tiny bacteria sitting inside the roots of specific plants and fixing nitrogen. Here you can see some examples of different species of plants that can form the symbiosis, but the, the symbiosis is, is specific to legumes, so peas, beans, uh, soybean, peanuts, and so on. So people are trying to understand the symbiosis. What, how do the bacteria get into the plant and form the symbiosis? And why do other plants not form the symbiosis if it's so um, beneficial? And answering this question might lead to engineering plants, for example, rice or wheat or corn that don't currently form the symbiosis so that they don't need synthetic nitrogen fertilizer and we can get rid of that huge problem of, of fertilization. So we are working on trying to understand that process. Um, this is a root growing in soil. This is a root tip and these beautiful fluorescent compounds are called flavonoids. They are signals that the plant makes and sends into the soil to activate the bacteria and to attract them to the root and to make them come towards the root to initiate that symbiosis. The bacteria then invade the root. This is a, a beautiful picture that uh, my PhD student Angus Ray took. Um, he developed this method to stain these, these structures that the bacteria form. This is a single plant cell here in green and the pink structure is called an infection thread. This is a structure that the bacteria form inside single cells of plants where they then multiply and move to the inside of the plant. The bacteria, oops, the bacteria then cause the cells inside the roots. This is a longitudinal section of the root. These ones are individual root cells. You can see these cells are divided and the bacteria make signaling molecules that make these cells divide and then develop into a, a bigger structure called a nodule. So this is the first sign that the bacteria have caused this nodulation to happen. And many people have worked for decades to try and understand the molecular signals that are required to make the symbiosis happen. And you're probably completely overwhelmed with detail on this figure and I don't expect anyone to take in any of the detail. The only purpose of the next four figures is to show you how complicated this process is. And this is only what we know. This is not including lots of other signals that we don't know. Okay, so there are receptors that have been identified that recognize signals from the bacteria. They then cause changes in gene expression of multiple genes necessary to initiate the nodule. So this is a recognition of the bacteria so that the plant really only lets in the bacteria that it wants to and not other ones. The plant then needs a whole lot of other mechanisms and proteins inside the cells that get invaded by these infection threads. So it's assembling a whole lot of proteins that makes this tube grow into the plant to deliver the bacteria into the plant cells where they then can fix nitrogen. Next, uh, a whole lot of genes have been identified that orchestrate the development of a nodule. So these signals have to control cell division in the root cell differentiation, formation of a nodule, and then controlling how that nodule functions. And lastly, the plant then has to uh, coordinate the exchange of nutrients uh, into and out of these nodule structures. And a lot of transporters have been identified on the plant membrane and on bacterial membranes. So here's a bacterium sitting inside a plant cell. It's almost like a new organelle, something like a chloroplast or mitochondrion, but this organelle produces nitrogen fertilizer for the plant. So it's a new 
endosymbiotic organism and the plant needs to supply it with nutrients but then take away all the nitrogen that the bacteria fix. So this has to be controlled very, very um, neatly. And so people have then looked at, well, is there actually anything, are these all genes in legumes that are specific for the symbiosis or have they just been repurposed and are they present in other plants? And here you can see uh, what people now do is, um, because we have genome sequences of so many different species, you can now look for genes that are present in legumes that are nodulating. So all the plants in blue are nodulating plants that have arisen in a certain clade of plants and not in others. And you can look for genes in the genome of all these species that are specific for nodulating species and that have been lost in non-nodulating species. And that has led to the discovery of just a few, surprisingly few genes that seem to be specific to nodulating species. And so the dream is to engineer the symbiosis into other species. Okay? So for that, we need to understand which genes are actually necessary out of all these complex networks of genes that I've just shown you, which ones are actually necessary and which ones are present in other plants for other purposes that just have been repurposed by these bacteria to form an order. So you're trying to identify unique genes, then design constructs that you can uh, transform into plant to try and repair nodulation in non-nodulating species of nitrogen fixing species or to transfer this into non-legumes. If that is successful, you would have a, a nodulating nitrogen fixing species that doesn't need any fertilizer. So far, nobody has been able to do this. It's just been too complex. So people have then got to go back and say, okay, let's analyze other genomes and, and go back and find new genes that we can then introduce into new species. So right at the end, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about how we teach uh, biology at the ANU. We are very keen on getting students involved in research because that's what we're passionate about. Um, we have practical and field classes. We've got research projects that students can do. We have uh, award-winning researchers and teaching teachers that will teach you these uh, topics in usually small classes and, and with modern lab facilities. Um, you will learn through a combination of lectures, small tutorials where you can discuss um, research papers, for example, um, laboratory classes where you actually um, get to try out all these things, um, field classes where you go out into different field sites uh, in Australia and sometimes overseas. And a lot of our learning takes place by um, being embedded uh, in a research group and having a tailored research project that you can do in the lab or in the field with a small research group. And this is where you really probably learn the most. Um, we have several master's uh, degrees at the ANU that are involved in, in uh, agriculture and plant science. And uh, this, this leads to uh, outcomes for uh, students in, in labs, in field work, and in policy and regulation uh, with all sorts of uh, um, employers, both in the public and private sector, at universities and research organizations and so on. With that, I want to thank you all for listening and I will try my best to answer everyone's questions. Thank you, Uli. Um, if you would like to stop sharing the screen, great. Um, there are a couple of questions already in the Q&A um, and yeah, more are coming through. So please submit your questions through. Um, Julie, and did you want to, you can get started on the first one. Okay, let me see. What are the factors which affect CO2 uptake in plants? Is it entirely genetic? Um, well, there's of course a, a, a large genetic component. So CO2 uptake is a physical process that is uh, controlled through, you know, physically the openings on the leaves, as well as whether the leaves have any coatings or hairs that might um, reduce uh, evaporation or uh, heat and so on. So it's, it's a structure of the leaf 
um, which is uh, both genetic but also influenced by the environment. So if you grow the same plant uh, in a different environment, it can adjust uh, its physiology, it can adjust its metabolism, so how fast it fixes CO2. It can also often change the structure of the leaf, uh, the density of uh, stomata and so on, which can uh, alter CO2 uptake by the plant. But the actual uptake is a, is a physical process um, that is controlled through the, yeah, the structure of the leaf. Uh, the, it's of course uh, also dependent on the CO2 concentration inside and outside the leaf. I hope that answers that question. So the next question is, if we develop a disease resistant plant and this plant on multiple generations does roll back to wild type or not, what is the percentage of adaptability to wild type and genetically modified plants? Okay, so it's this question I think is about would they revert back to wild type? Well, they, they can of course, but uh, I guess what people will try to do is always so, so you sow a generation of seed that has been uh, bred for certain characteristics. And um, if you were sowing multiple, multiple generations, it, it could revert. Um, but you always, you would always, as a farmer, you could always go back to the original seed stock and you would always grow uh, the genetically uniform plants that, um, have certain uh, disease resistance, for example. All right, so the next question was, are there any plant cell culture systems that give fruitful results for transfer of not gene to develop a transgenic plant? Yes, there are many. So the limitation is not that we can't transform the plants. Um, people have transformed plants with a, a lot of these genes. So even uh, some of the genes that we know are necessary for perception of the rhizobia and transduction of the signals and so on. People have transferred multiple of these genes through two non-legumes through tissue culture and transformation. And the tissue culture and transformation works and the genes are expressed, but so far, those uh, plants have not been able to form a symbiosis with, with the bacteria. And uh, one reason for that might be that when you express these genes in a new plant, they are sort of in a different context. And they are often not expressed in the right cell types. And so in addition to just putting in a gene that codes for the correct enzyme that you might need for a certain function, you also have to give that gene some instructions about where it needs to be uh, expressed in a certain cell type or under certain conditions. So that is specified in the promoter of that gene, which ideally you want to transfer that in as well. But that promoter often is uh, species specific. So uh, different plants could interpret that promoter in, in slightly different ways. So it's not, it's uh, the, the, the tissue culture and transformation is, uh, has been successful. It's uh, making the genes work in a different species uh, that has been difficult. All right, another question. How exactly does increasing photosynthetic efficiency lead to better yield? That is a good question. So the idea is that uh, through photosynthesis, you basically take CO2 and turn it into sugar. And that sugar then can be used to make, to make the plant grow. It can produce uh, energy for the plant or it can be converted into starch that can be stored in the seeds. So by just producing more sugars, you would produce more material to fill your grains. But there is another component um, that would explain the yield increase, especially under water limiting conditions. And that is that if you're more efficient at capturing the CO2, in theory, you don't have to open your stomata as much and you don't lose as much water. And because water is often a rate limiting step indirectly, that also makes a plant more efficient. And a third component is that if you think about the, the Robisco enzyme, 
an enzyme is a protein and a protein contains a lot of nitrogen. If you have the same protein, uh, and, and, and Rubisco is the most abundant protein in plants, so it accounts for the majority of the protein in the leaves. So it is a, it is a big uh, sink for nitrogen. And so if you imagine having the same enzyme, but it's more efficient, then in theory, you do, don't need as many copies of that protein in the, in the leaf. And so you also indirectly would reduce the amount of nitrogen that's necessary to produce all these proteins. And that's a third indirect way of increasing yield. I hope that's answered that question. And the next question is, and um, do, do plant GMOs also contribute to the global emission? So uh, GM or not doesn't really uh, make a, a difference per se in emissions. So I guess uh, if you mean that, um, so we produce genetically modified plants for, for various purposes, okay? And, and one main purposes would be to save water or fertilizer, for example. So if you make the plant more efficient, um, then you would reduce uh, um, inputs into agriculture that cause those emissions. But it's not, necess it's not really a, a factor of whether they're GMO or not. It it's really depends on the specific function that would be introduced in those plants. And, and it could also, you know, it doesn't have to be a genetic modification. Uh, it could be introduced by breeding as well. Okay, the next question is, how is plant-based meat produced? What are the steps being taken or planned to be taken to reduce the footprint produced by livestock? <coughs> also, how can we genetically modify and make some crops that are resistant to diseases? Okay, so I'll just do the first question to first. I guess plant-based meat is really just um, plant components that are made to taste like meat. So. It could be, um, it's mainly a plant protein and, and one of the biggest um, uh, plant products uh, for, for um, plant protein are, are actually legumes, um, in particular soybean. So a lot of plant-based meat is produced from soybean protein and it can be mixed with other ingredients, plant-based ingredients. Actually, um, one ingredient that can make that meat look uh, red like normal meat is actually um, a protein from legume nodules called leg hemoglobin, which is uh, related to human hemoglobin, but it's a plant hemoglobin that is used inside nitrogen fixing nodules to capture oxygen because the enzyme that produced that fixes nitrogen is very sensitive to oxygen. So this leg hemoglobin has actually been used uh, as a as an addition to plant protein to produce um, red looking meat like products. Um, what are the steps being taken to reduce the footprint by livestock? So there are many approaches to reduce the footprint of livestock. Um, the main one is to not feed them with uh, grains that have been, uh, you know, that had a high input of fertilizer. So uh, grazing versus uh, feedlot production makes a huge difference to, um, to the footprint of, of animals. Um, a lot of animals uh, in Australia are grazed on pasture and that has a, a, a lesser uh, impact. The other thing that people are doing that helps uh, a lot with the methane emissions from, from ruminant animals is that there are specific uh, seaweed, sea, species of seaweed, red seaweed, that if you include it into the food of uh, a cow's cattle, reduces the amount of methane that they emit. And there are also approaches at trying to immunize uh, cattle against uh, the bacteria in their rumen that make the methane. So the methane is produced by bacteria that live in their, in their stomach that uh, that uh, convert CO2 to, to methane. So by reducing the activity of those bacteria, you can reduce the methane emissions. And the last part of that question was, how can we genetically modify and make some crops that are resistant to diseases? 
that is also a very good question. That is done by trying to identify which, pro so plants have proteins that um, recognize certain signals from the pathogens, from like fungi and bacteria. And if you find the right proteins um, that can recognize certain signals and put them into a plant, the plant will recognize signals from these uh, pathogens and initiate an immune response in the, in the plant. And that immune response will just kill a few cells where these pathogens are trying to infect. And that stops the bacterial infection. So that has been done through breeding uh, you could do it by genetically modifying plants, but uh, breeding is usually the more acceptable way of, of achieving this. All right, the next question, are there ideas to add other photosystems like the anoxygenic photosynthesis of the Helobacter selenarium using the bacterial rhodopsin? This would give plants the opportunity to use the whole visible spectrum. Yes, as far as I know, I don't know about this, specific bacterium, but there are certainly people uh, who are working on all sorts of photosystems from bacteria, including here, um, including, for example, uh, cyanobacteria, which are much uh, more efficient at photosynthesis than higher plants. So that is certainly being done, yes. Can, how can we use synthetic biology to make a symbiont, like in the case of rhizobium you just showed, or maybe to other crops, not just legumes? Very good question. So those bacteria actually already exist. So there are a lot of bacteria that are not rhizobium. They are free living and sometimes they are symbiotic with other plants that fix nitrogen. Um, so people are using, we don't even have to engineer it. So there are other really efficient nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, but uh, most of them are free living and they, are, they don't uh, manage to infect plants. Um, so what people are trying to do as an alternative to engineering nitrogen fixing symbiosis, they're trying to just improve the efficiency of nitrogen fixing bacteria that naturally live in soils and that associate with, with plants, just not very efficiently, but they associate with plants and they do fix some nitrogen the only plant in which this is very efficient is sugarcane. So sugarcane, because of its high sugar content, has a, has a high capacity to feed these microbes. And people are using these other bacteria. You can buy them. Farmers can buy formulations of these bacteria to put on their crops. And um, they're just not as efficient um, as rhizobia. Um, but they do exist, and people are trying to make them um, trying to engineer a, a niche for them uh, on the plant, for example. So the next question is, will modification of non-leguminous plant for symbiosis affect the natural growth of that plant? Yes, very, very good question. What are the negatives of that? Yes, very good question. Um, Yes, there are negatives of that. Um, and that is probably the reason why a lot of plants have either not evolved this ability in the first place, or even within legumes, many species have lost this. So, so one, one, uh, one uh, negative uh, side effect could be that um, a lot of resources that could go into growing uh, seeds are diverted into the roots to feed the bacteria. So there is a cost of the symbiosis and there's quite a high cost. And even in legumes, if you give them fertilizer, they prefer fertilizer to forming the symbiosis because the plant has to direct a lot of sugars uh, into the roots. So it could lead to a, a yield decrease, but you have to weigh that up against um, the cost of fertilizer and the cost of the pollution. But there's, there's definitely a, a side effect. There could also be a side effect, we don't know yet, there could be a side effect on how the plant deals with other microbes because you're now opening the doors to certain bacteria and while that is very well regulated, you have to be very careful to not um, change the immune system of the plant in a way that would allow pathogens to come in. So. We haven't been able to engineer it into any other plant to, to test that directly, but my prediction would be 
that there could be a, a yield penalty and there could be a, a, a possible disease penalty, but that could probably be engineered because the recognition is very, very specific. So will there be any effect if we modify the microorganisms that attack plants instead of modifying the plants? So that is very difficult. So we cannot uh, modify pathogens like the past they're, they're just everywhere like uh, you couldn't because they they're coming from everywhere and they are everywhere it's, it's very difficult to do but um there has been a strategy i don't think we can really do this for for pathogens directly but um there are things like gene drives. So people have, uh, this, this has been mainly used uh, in, in animals, uh, in insects, for example, and people are trying to use it in mice. So we have a huge mouse plague in, in Australia at the moment. So gene drives are genetic elements that you can introduce in, into an organism and that will be passed on to, to offspring so it can move very quickly to the population, but it, it, it in the end it will uh, either uh, completely reduce the fertility or it will, for example, eliminate males in the population. So, so this has been used, uh, for example, to, um, to eliminate uh, mosquitoes that uh, transmit dengue fever in, in Queensland. It's been so far quite successful, but it has never been used in modifying actual pathogenic fungi. Um, and the, just the onslaught of, of, of pathogens from, from from everywhere around the world would make it almost impossible to, to you know, engineer them all. What you could do is to engineer beneficial bacteria or beneficial fungi that help the plant fight uh, detrimental fungi. So there are beneficial fungi uh, that live inside plants, they're called fungal endophytes, and they actually help the plant uh, fighting uh, other uh, uh, pathogens. So rather than modifying the pathogen, which is uh, very difficult in, in the fields, you could uh, basically sort of immunize the plant or, or help it by giving them sort of like a probiotic. It's like, you know, eating yogurt or something. Um, you, you feed them uh, beneficial organisms that help them uh, with their immunity indirectly. Uh, okay, there's a question about how can we have efficient uptake of carbon dioxide with less tomato opening? Good question. So that is possible. So there are plants that have different types of photosynthesis. So for example, um, there are plants that uh, capture the carbon at night um, without, so, so a lot of plants have to open their tomato during the day when they uh, photosynthesize and produce uh, ATP and uh, they need to fix the CO2 at the same time. And so opening the stomata during the day is obviously the worst thing because that's when it's warm and you lose most of the CO2. There are other plants that have different types of photosynthesis that allows them to either photosynthesize at, at night or to capture the CO2 and, and relocate it within other tissues. And there are several approaches, uh, including people um, working in this department that are trying to, util to, trying to transfer this type of more efficient uh, CO2 capture into other plants. Uh, there's a big uh, project on C4 rice. Uh, C4 uh, metabolism is a different, more efficient type of photosynthesis to counteract exactly this problem so that uh, plants can photosynthesize more efficiently while keeping the stomata closed and reducing water loss. Thank you for that nice comment. Thank you all for your great questions. They were really excellent questions. Really thoughtful. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Uli. That was a very informative uh, webinar. And on behalf of, of, I've just seen another question that has come in. Do you oh. want to take it, Uli, or would- I will take it because okay. flagmites are my favorite molecules. So, so flavonoid components act as signals for the symbiotic bacteria. It isn't that only legumes have flavonoids, most other plants do. That is true. Then why is it specific for legumes that their flavonoids act as chemoattractants for those bacteria? Good questions as well. Um, 
they are about, plants produce many, many different types of flavonoids. There are about 10,000 different structures and different plant species, even different legumes produce combinations of very different structures or unique, not necessarily unique, but certainly quite specific uh, cocktails of these flavonoids. But it is not completely specific. Um, uh, it is partly specific because they are symbionts uh, and they are specific rhizobia that are attracted to specific legumes. They, the bacteria have proteins uh, that act like receptors for flavonoids and those proteins are specific for certain structures of flavonoids, but not completely. Um, and so it is actually uh, the case that the flavonoids from other plants also affect rhizobia. And in fact, that's often a good thing because uh, people have found that if you, if you use crop rotation, so often people rotate uh, legumes with cereals, for example, to increase uh, nitrogen input into fields, or they intercrop, you know, you grow a row of legumes with a row of maize or something. That is actually uh, more efficient for the symbiosis to have uh, other species there that also uh, exude flavonoids into the soil. So flavonoids from other species are not sufficient to allow them to uh, form a symbiosis, but they certainly indirectly do also affect the behavior of rhizobia uh, in the soil. So that was a very good question. Right. Once again, thank you, Uli, and thank you, everyone, for attending and for those questions. Um, for those that have an interest in the sciences, in biology and sustainability or any of the other sciences, we do have some more talks lined up for the rest of this month. So please do come along and register for them if you haven't yet. Um, and yes, Uli, thank you once again. Well, I, before you go, um, I understand people can find Uli on the ANU website and her research group and, of course, the entire division of plant sciences and what research is going on here. So, uh, yep. Please email me if you have any other questions. That, uh, I'm very happy. It's very great to see so much interest. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Uli. I'll go and add more legumes to my diet for now. That's what I would do. Um, and yeah, have a good day, everyone else. Okay. Um, wherever you are. So take care. Thank you, right. Thank you Jay. Thank you, Bye. Lee. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.